Nothing disciplines your life like vision. And discipline is simply defined as self-imposed standards for the sake of a higher goal. Again, discipline is defined as self-imposed standards for the sake of a higher goal. So I'm, I'm talking now about self-discipline. All leaders have to have the quality of self-discipline. You are not a leader if you are not self-disciplined. Now, self-discipline implies that there are other discipline. In other words, discipline externally is considered other discipline. A leader doesn't need much discipline from the outside. They self-impose discipline on themselves. And that is what we call self-discipline. Now, the key to achieving your vision is discipline. And this scripture found in Proverbs 29, we read it early this week. It says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Blessed is the man who keeps the law. A little definition here of what that means. Where there is no vision, people throw off restraint. That's what that word perish means. It means to throw off self-control. In other words, where there is no revelation of the future, people throw off self-discipline. So the key to your life is finding a vision that imposes discipline on you. In essence, vision is the source of discipline. I'll explain discipline in a minute, what, what, what it means, how it works. Discipline is the root of leadership. It actually is the, the very nature that attracts people to you. A disciplined person naturally begins to attract people because people admire discipline in other people. That's why we go to see athletes perform. We really admire the discipline that they put themselves through. If you do the same thing as a person, people will then begin to believe what you say. Your very life of discipline creates trust. People trust a person who they perceive to be disciplined. This is why athletes also are used to promote and advertise and market products. People, they are selling the discipline of that athlete. Okay? Not their fame, but their discipline. We think it's a discipline. I mean, it's a fame. It's actually a discipline. We, we, we think that if we wear Nike shoes, we will jump like Mike. Okay? So the, the idea that they sold us was, if you want to be like Mike, now you know... 180 pounds and some chitlins, you cannot be like Mike. But you still buy the Nike shoes because the idea is what you're wearing. So you are buying the discipline that he has in his life that produced the kind of professional athleticism that he is known for. And so you are really um, impacted by the discipline. Uh, we love to watch sports and not play it. Why? We admire those athletes because of their discipline. The same thing is true about you. If you remain consistent and disciplined in your life, you'll find people will come just to watch you. And they'll want to actually pay to watch you. They'll bring their offerings and their tithes to watch you do what you do. It's incredible. So discipline is powerful. And according to the Bible, discipline comes from vision. Vision. A man or woman without a clear vision for their lives lives a very loose life. But a man with a vision, they live a very narrow life. Very important. The disciplined people live very narrowly. When a man or woman has a vision, their life becomes very, very tight. Why? Because vision simplifies life. What do I mean by this? Again, it'll take a couple of days to teach this, but it's very important. When you capture a vision, it simplifies everything. Everything. Because vision controls all of your choices after that. Once you know where you're going, you also automatically know what roads won't take you there. You understand that statement? Yeah. So if, 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 if you know what to do, 
you automatically know what you shouldn't do. Vision defines your what to do in life. Because vision gives you your address, your permanent address. It shows you your destination, where we get our word destiny from. Your destiny dictates your decisions. Write it down. Your destiny dictates your decisions. So life becomes simple. Uh, if someone offers you something and it doesn't uh, collaborate in its unity with your vision, it's easy to say no. See, but without a vision, it's tough for you to refuse things. Life becomes complicated. Let's take another thought here and see if we can push this a little further. You were not born to do everything. Say amen. Boy, I'm so glad when the Lord told me that. I said, oh, thank you. The pressure is off. We somehow have this attitude that we have a lot of things to do in life. I disagree. I used to think so myself. You don't have a lot to do in life. Isn't that wonderful? When you study people who have been successful in their lives and eventually became influential, like Moses, and Joseph, and Joshua, and David, and Paul, Jesus, Abraham, Lincoln, Abraham himself. I mean, all these people, you think their lives are they're very simple people. Very simple people. There's a term that is normally associated with them. Here's, here's a term. This one thing I do. See, you've got to get to the point where you're only living for one thing. And life becomes simple. People who discovered vision, they live longer. They live healthier. There's no stress. Stress comes from not knowing what to do. You remember the story of Matthew, I mean Martha rather, and Mary. Jesus said something to Martha that changed my life. Let me talk with Martha for a couple of minutes. Martha's an interesting woman. Martha is like most of us. We live on assumptions. Even of God. Martha had a visitation from God. He came to visit her house. Guess what she did? She assumed he was hungry. See, that's the problem. We think we know what God wants us to do. One thing you learn from this summit so far is that vision is from God. You don't tell him what you are going to do. You got to report to him, submit to him, and stay still until you are clear of the Revelation. <laughs> because without that revelation, there is no self-discipline. Martha ended up cooking for God and he wasn't hungry. And then she became angry because other people were not joining her in her busyness, which was not appropriate. <laughs> in other words, she tried to get other people involved in things that was not God's will at the time. I wonder if you're doing that. Martha proceeded to cook for God. And then she came to God and says, Look, why don't other people come and help me? Send my sister to help me. Now the answer Jesus gave you must study. It was a leadership answer. He said, Martha, you are so busy about many things. Tell your neighbor, I think that's me. And that's what your life is like. All of you who have known me for the past 20 years, you know that I, have, I haven't changed. I've grown, but I haven't changed. There's a difference between growing and changing. I grow in my knowledge, in my experience, in my experience, but I haven't changed. I am still the same guy with the same message. Same intent. That makes my life simple. He says, you're busy about so many things. You're trying to do everything. You're trying to be everybody and trying to be everything to everybody. And then he said to her, Martha, big words, only few things are necessary. Boy, that's a beauty, eh? He said, look, 
Life is filled with a million questions every day and a million things to do. He said, but only a few things really necessary to do in life. Let me ask you a question. Are the things you've done for the past 11 months in this year, were they necessary? Don't answer it, just think about it. You might be shocked at your answer. The question then is, what is necessary? How, you, how do you define necessary? It's, it's answered in the Bible very clearly. It's easy to find what's necessary. Necessary, according to Paul, the apostle, is defined like this. Paul says in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, he said, all things are permitted for me to do. I can do anything I want. He says, but not all things benefit me. Interesting. I don't care how old you are now, you're going to soon be dead. 70 years is so short, you ain't got time to make a mistake anymore. And if you're 40 years old, you are already over the 50% mark. So you better make sure you clear this thing quickly about what your vision is and define it so you waste no more days. You're going to be dead soon. This is no time for experimentation. This is a time for intentional living. You've got to know where you're going now. This is too late to take detours and go through corners you ain't supposed to go through and wondering how to get there. You better know your destination from this mountain. When you leave here with your certificate tomorrow, you better have a clear idea. And that's why this session is important for you. Because you ain't getting no younger, see. He said, Martha, only a few things are necessary in life. There's some people in your life who are not necessary. Some of you got the wrong company. And they've eaten up your time, wasting your time. Eating with them and playing with them and watching TV with them and going to clubs with them and, you know, going out to, to, to conferences with them and all this stuff and all this stuff. And God is saying, look, you're still not getting where you're supposed to get to. These people are distractions. Some of the books you have been buying are not necessary. Romance novels. Magazines. Fashion. I mean, they don't get you to your dream. You see, when you have a vision, it simplifies life. You can walk up to a bookstore shelf and know exactly what books not to buy. See, vision dictates everything. Matter of fact, let me just give you some, some indications of how it controls your power of choice. The statement here, I'm sure you know it well, right? Jack of all trades, master of none. <laughs> you become a leader when you find a thing you're supposed to master. Everything that you do is supposed to be motivated by your vision. Everything. Vision is supposed to be the source of your human motivation. It simplifies your life. Do you know why most people are actually poor? I know why they're poor. Poverty, like we learned last night, is a, it's not a problem. It's a result. Most people are poor because no one knows who they are. What do we mean by that? Vision helps you identify yourself before the people in the world. And because they know who you are, they know what to come to you for. Let me give you another statement. Very important. This is so important. If you want to be successful, write this down, do not seek success. Seek to become a person of value. Again, if you want to be successful in life, do not seek success. Seek to become 
a person of value. In other words, write it this way, make yourself valuable and they'll pay for you. Make yourself valuable and people will pay for you. That is what we do with gold, silver. How about gasoline, water? Our society has made these things what? Valuable. So we do what? We pay a lot of money for them because we made them valuable. Well, make yourself just like gold. In other words, develop a gift in your life that has become so valuable to everybody else that they will pay you to perform it. Les Brown and I were chatting one day. And uh, we became good friends over the past 10 years or so. And uh, one day we were chatting. Some of you were doing a conference together. And I was telling him about this invitation I got to go and speak to this company. And I said, uh, I said, uh, how much should I request as a fee from this company? And he said, how much do you think you are worth? To that company. I said, I don't know. I was just starting in, in that particular area of the business of public speaking. And I said, I don't know, maybe four or five thousand bucks. He said, that's all you think you're worth? I said, they only want me to speak for an hour and a half. He said, that's what you think you're worth? I said, how much do you charge them for an hour and a half? He said, twenty-five thousand dollars. Starting price. He said, if you charge them less than that, I'm ashamed of you. He said, you're better than me. And he was serious about it. So I filled out a contract and put $25,000. The check was in the mail the next day. Make yourself a person of value. Don't seek success. Let me give you another example of how it works. If someone had to think about something that reminded them of you, what would it be? That's a serious question. Because if they never think about you, that means you have never made yourself valuable. You will become a jack of too many trades. So you master nothing. You think of Tiger Woods, what do you think about? Michael Jordan, what do you think about? Barbara Streisand, what do you think about? Interesting. That's a good answer. Barbara Streisand, you think about two things, don't you? Acting and singing. See, she developed two gifts. What do they think about when they call your name? Your problem is they don't think about you at all. Become so good in an area that they can't ignore you. The world is filled with general people. You've come to this conference to cease being general. You're not in the general group anymore. You, you got to go home and decide for the next 20 years, I'm going to carve out a niche for myself that they're going to have to find me and can't ignore me. You ever heard Jesus talk? Boy, he talked with such confidence. I am the bread of life. If any man hunger, he made himself valuable to them. I am the water of life. If any man thirsts, in other words, if anyone think of water, they think about me. He was trying to get across his value to them. So the crowds pressed him by the thousands to try and get to the water. Vision is what gives you this unique discovery about what you're supposed to master. So in my book on leadership, on my vision, I hope you get a copy of it and read it. 
it talks about the fact that sight is the ability to see things as they are, but vision is the capacity to see things as they could be. Now, this next statement is important. Write it in bold letters, please. All true visions will be tested for authenticity. All true visions will be tested for authenticity. If your vision is truly from God, life will test it to prove that it's authentic. So get used to the idea of challenges if your vision is real. It doesn't come to stop your vision, it came to test it, to prove it that it's true, if it's real. If a vision is terminated by trials, it was probably not authentic. Sometimes your vision may take you to prison, but you got to go there with it and come out with it, like Nelson Mandela. Suppose Nelson really wasn't serious about destroying apartheid when he stood in that courtroom as a 24-year-old lawyer. Just suppose. He said, you know, this ain't worth it, man. I'm going to go back to my job, forget these people. You know, they can stand the oppression. I got me a good job. I'm out of the neighborhood where I was, out of the slums. I'm going to be a lawyer in South Africa, and I'm going to make me some money, forget my brethren. He could have said that. But his vision was so authentic to him. He said, I'd go to jail and lose my adult life for the sake of this vision. How much are you willing to pay to keep what you believe in? Vision is powerful. Write this down, please. True vision is discovered when you discover something you're supposed to die for. Visionary leaders ask the question, what kind of history do you dream of making? We're in this session to talk about how to write that vision down. But these are some preliminary thoughts you need to have in your mind. What is it that you'd like to do to write your part of history? In other words, do something that they cannot erase from history. And you don't need to do great, massive things. We keep thinking, I do great, for example, the woman who poured the oil on the body of Jesus. You know what he said about her? I mean, that was such a simple act, eh? She took some perfume, which is believed to have been some embalming type fluid as well, because he said, this was for my burial. The scent of that stuff was so strong, they knew what it was. Very precious spices from northern Africa and Asia. And that was imported stuff. It's very expensive. She had a little vial of it. Probably cost about $15,000 in, in our modern day currency. And she took that and rubbed it on the body of Jesus. And it was just a simple act. And that's it. She vanished out of history. Guess what? We're not even sure what her name is. It doesn't tell us what her name was. Now some people assume it's Mary and all that Mary Magdalene. You know, it, it doesn't quite say who it was. But yet Jesus said, what she has done will be spoken of all through history. See, some of you think you got to build a big building like Dr. Miles Monroe or build a school. No, there's some little things you were born to do that they can't get rid of. For example, there's no such thing as the gospel according to Andrew. Is that right? Yes. Amazing. He has no gospel. But yet, it was Andrew who brought Jesus to Peter. Or Peter to Jesus, rather. In other words, he was the connector. There has to be an Andrew that history can't forget. You may never stand here where I am and be under the camera lights. That may not be your vision for being born. But whatever you're supposed to do is not supposed to be erased. That's why I am convinced you were not created just to make a living and pay bills. You were created to give life and make a difference with your gift somewhere. That's why you came to this place. Here are some things that vision will do when you discover it. One, vision will choose your future. Two, vision will choose your friends. Three, vision will choose your library. Four, vision will choose your use of time. Five, vision will choose your use of energy. Six, vision will choose 
your movies that you waste your money on. <laughs> Seven, vision will choose your priorities in life. Eight, vision will even choose your hobbies. Even the games you play should be related to your vision. I used to hate golf. <laughs> Why? I didn't understand golf. You normally hate things you don't understand. And one day I was watching uh, Bill Crosby on a show, and he was talking about golf, and he had me laughing. Man, I was laughing. And Bill Crosby kept on saying, golf is a stupid game. He had these grown men out on this place hitting a little ball with a piece of stick, and then putting it in the hole, taking it back out, and then hit it again, put it in the hole. He said, this is so stupid. And so I got my philosophy about golf from Bill Cosby. <laughs> so one day, a friend of mine who's here today said, he said, Doc, you want to go play some golf? I said, golf? That's a stupid game. I said, oh, only grown men walk around with a piece of stick, hit this ball in the hole, take it out. He said, that's a stupid game. He said, look, you want to go at least and go on the course and let me, you know, at least show you how to do it. I said, okay, no problem. Let's go. I said, you got, you know, got a day off. Let's go take it. So we rented this course and uh, we rented stuff because, you know, I mean, I don't know. I don't like golf. So they rented me the stuff and uh, they rented even the shoes I had on. I had to rent the shoes. We went on the course and he says, he says, hit, you know. And he showed me how to hit the thing. And it's beautiful. I love that. You know, the environment there is wonderful. And I hit this thing. And when I hit that first ball, an anointing came upon me. <laughs> See, some of you all don't know what we're talking about unless you've been in. You, anyone know what I'm talking about? Come on, you golfers. There's an anointing on the golf course that no one understands. I mean, I don't know whether I was, you know, just born to be good at it. <laughs> but when I hooked, took that thing and I swung, I mean, the ball went, ah! Woo! And I went, I say, my God. I said, let me try that again. <laughs> Hit it again. Bang! After the fourth time, I started feeling this thing. And, the, and then the guy says, look, it's time to go. I said, don't go yet, man. We got to get just a couple more holes, man. <laughs> we stayed out there for four hours. Next morning, I said, let's go. <laughs> the, next, the next day, we went on the course. And he had someone with him. It was a movie star. I said, oh. He said, this is the guy who stars in New York Cops on TV. I said, I was interested in this guy. I said, wow, I saw you on TV. That's right. He said, I saw you on TV too, man. <laughs> we began to chat. We walked into the, to the golf shop on the course. I saw another movie star, another athlete. And all these folks who I knew in boxes. I said, my goodness, this is where everybody gathers. It's where the money is. Oh, I began to act like I was a golfer, you know. <laughs> yeah, this is life out here. I said, man, how did, how, 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 did, how did you do yesterday? Didn't know what I was talking about at all, you know. <laughs> My third time on the golf course was incredible. They took me out to Pebble Beach. Now, you golfers know about Pebble Beach, right? Tiger Woods, Arnold Schwarzenegger, everybody out there. And I, I don't know anything about golf, nor Pebble Beach. I don't know what Pebble Beach is. So here we are going to the Pebble Beach, and I'm walking out there, and anybody who's anybody is there on the course. And I'm like, all the money's out here, billions of dollars on the course. The course. And they say, this, this is where deals are made. I said, take me on the course every day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the people I met out there are people who had my money. You can get it after I'm gone. See, some of you pastors ain't know what you're missing. You better go learn golf. The anointing is on the course, man. Your hobbies should be related to your vision. If you're going to play dominoes, play with rich people. <laughs> Let your hobbies bring you into environments that expand your vision and your networks. Coming here, some of you came because there's a little vacation built into this. But look at what you are getting and meeting while you're here. Mm -hmm. And there are people in this group who got a lot of money. I mean, some of them I tell you, but you only know who you're sitting next to. They got millions of dollars. But they ain't, got, they, they ain't here for that. They, they're here for some other reasons. 
And part of it may be for you just to get to know one another. What do you choose to play with? Even let your play be with a purpose. Everybody say play with purpose. It's important. You know, having your own aircraft is incredible too. It's a whole new world. Because you never go through the normal airports anymore. So all the private airports are only filled with people who own their planes. You know what that means? Use your imagination. So now I meet all these people who you never see. It's amazing. Vision chooses your hobbies. Next, big one. <laughs> vision chooses your diet. Number 12, vision chooses how you invest your money. 13, vision chooses how you write your to-do list. In other words, your to-do list should be created by your vision. What am I going to do today or this week? It will be things that will take me toward my vision. 14, vision chooses your attitude in life. If you know where you're going, it tells you how to think. 15, vision chooses your life. It tells you what kind of life you're supposed to end up living. And so it chooses what kind of lifestyle you begin living right now. Vision dictates everything. People who have no vision in their lives, they throw off restraint. They throw off self-control. They have no idea. 16, vision chooses your life's plan. It tells you what to plan for your life. How to plan your living. And next, vision dictates your values. Very important, we learned about this all week. When you know what you were born to do, it dictates how you should behave and what kind of standards you should live by. Right away, it changes everything. You still writing? I'm sorry. Then it's too late. <laughs> Buy the tape and get the book. The impact of vision on leadership. Let's write this down, please. Vision clarifies purpose. It gives direction to the leader and it empowers the leader beyond his assets or her assets. Very important. Vision clarifies purpose. In other words, purpose is what you were born to do. Vision gives it clarity. And then vision also empowers you to know your direction you're supposed to go in and your assets. It goes beyond your assets. In other words, vision does not allow you to live by what you don't have. It takes you beyond that. You begin to believe in things that you have no money to pay for. And that's important. Because if you keep living by what you don't have, you'll never rise above what you don't have. Vision literally creates resources. Vision attracts resources. It, 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 uh, people don't give to people, they give to vision. These things that you call government grants are literally resources that are looking for vision. When you go to get a grant, they don't say they can give you this to spend money. They, they, they always ask you, show me your vision first. What are we giving this money to? It's not to you, it's to the vision that you have. Vision attracts resources. And so it's important for you to really clarify your vision and make it so plain that anyone can see it like you see it. Wise people make choices that protect their vision. Very important. By the way, uh, on the list I gave you earlier, it does say vision chooses your friends, huh? Let me tell you something about how important that is. Once you know where you want to go in life, it decides your company. I have very few friends in my life. Very few. And I don't want any more. I have millions of acquaintances. And I'm stuck with millions of brothers and sisters. They ain't my friends. You see? You're born with your brothers and sisters. But you choose your friends. And your friends are more important than your brothers and sisters. The Bible is very clear. It says a friend is closer than a brother. Let me define a friend for you. A friend is anyone who is willing 
committed and can help you get to your destiny. A friend is anyone who is willing and committed to help you get to your destiny. That's a friend. So if you want to be great, don't keep company with small-minded people. If you want to be a success, stay away from failures. Coming to this summit is a choice to keep company. You're keeping company with friends like us. You come here and you get your dream and your vision stimulated, fertilized, watered, encouraged. That's the right friendship you want. I always describe the example to me, this is the greatest one I've discovered in life, is between Mary and Elizabeth. I talk about it all the time. You know, Mary was pregnant with the greatest gift in the world. And the angel said, if you want to have this baby, you got to go find Elizabeth. And when she found Elizabeth, it said when they looked at each other, the babies leaped. Don't be with anyone who doesn't make your baby leap. Your dream should be stimulated by your friends. Every time you're around them, they're supposed to impact you to keep going, to believe. Anyone who becomes a negative to your dream is what I call pollution. They are experts in abortion. Be careful. They are after your baby. Sometimes it's people of your own household. Sometimes your own family is bad company. You got to know that. That's why Mary had to leave Joseph's presence because Joseph was not yet converted about this child. He was considering what? Putting her away. Abortion. There's some friends that you left home before you came here and when you go down the mountain, you got to go down the other side. I am not kidding. Because what you heard here this week, you better protect it. You should have never come here if you want to keep your old friends. Write this down. You can outgrow your friends. A lot of you don't know how dangerous your company is. So let me give you another principle to work with. If in your group that you call your friends, if you are the smartest one in the group, it's time to leave the group. <laughs> if they always asking you the questions, you may think that's great, that's bad. You want to be in the company of friends who make you think, who expand you, who you ask questions to. People who ain't going nowhere want you to go with them. That's why they don't want you to leave the group. Because folks who ain't doing nothing want you to do it with them. So they say, oh, you're going to join that other group, huh? You're going to abandon us, huh? Absolutely yes. There are some friends who I grew up with right here in this island. I'm talking about 40 years ago. And they are still sitting under the same tree, playing on the same domino board with the same dominoes. I can still find them. And you got friends like that too. Vision chooses your friends. Vision is the best next thing to time travel. I like that, man. I tell you, that's great. You know, uh, when you have a vision, that means you are, you are spacey. <laughs> Always spaced out. It's great to be spaced out. Because earth is too dangerous to live on. Vision is seeing the future before it comes into being. Here's what vision means. Vision means you expect more of your world than what you see. 
Vision means you take bold steps of faith. Vision is a, as a venture out with risk-taking courage. Vision means to dare to hope for something beyond yourself. Vision is critical. Boy, I could almost hear in my spirit some of y'all taking some good notes. And when I hear this again, this is going to sound just like yours. You're going to teach this up. At least tell them you got it from the summit. At least, you know, you don't got to call no names or anything. Just say, I got it from, the, from a summit I was at. <laughs> Vision is so critical. It literally makes you believe in a better world. It becomes more real. And I believe what we heard in the, in the last two sessions we had here was so deep. I was taking notes like crazy because what we heard was so critical. And Dr. Chris was talking about the subconscious mind. And then Dr. Raphael Messiah was talking about the subconscious mind. So important. Uh, I was sharing with one of my colleagues when he was teaching. I said, I said, do you realize what he just said? That your body and what you show us is fake. Your real self is your subconscious self. So if nothing gets into your subconscious self, it's not real yet. That was a powerful thing. That's why the Bible said, let these things sink down into your heart. Get it into your subconscious mind. Then it becomes real. All right. Vision is unlimited sight. That's a Miles Monroe quote, so make sure I give him my name on that. Eh? It's unlimited. Ability to see without limit. The power to do that. All right. A couple more comments, and then we look at this, the system of writing your vision down. The vision you have for your life creates consequences and effects how you spend your time and your resources. What does that mean? It means that a strong vision inspires passion. This passion transforms and controls your life, and vision is the source of that discipline that that life creates. Without vision, sight has no hope. And therefore, when you have vision, you can always live in the midst of difficulty with a good attitude. A good attitude. The greatest leaders in the present But focus intently on the future are the ones who win. Living in the present is fine, but don't put your focus there. It's too much depression. Be an agent of hope. I'm moving too, too slow. All right. Here we go. Here are the ten components of writing a vision. And I get, give you a chance to ask some questions in the last five minutes, okay? Number one. A vision should be clear and simple. When you're writing a vision down, please do not be afraid if you're writing many pages. Now, let me just explain this to you. The process I sometimes take my classes through in training to write vision, especially when I'm dealing with corporate companies, I tell them, I said, look, first you got to do is go find a quiet place. Get away from everybody. Take no music with you. Get away from television. Get away from all distractions. Go on the beach or go in the bush. Because in order for you to, to hear your insides, you got to get rid of distractions on the outsides. If you study the Bible carefully, the characters in Scripture, most of them received their vision for their lives when they were out in the hills somewhere. Moses used to live in Egypt, remember? That was big civilization, big city time. For 40 years, God didn't show him anything. But now he's stuck in the back of the desert as a fugitive, with sheep who can't talk to him, no trees, barren land. And God says, I think I got him now. David, stuck out there in the hills with them sheep, little harp, nothing to do all day while the sheep are eating, just kind of sitting down there worshiping God. Gets a vision. Joseph, out there in the back of the hills, no big city lights, no shopping centers, no malls. Out there by himself, God shows him his dream. The reason why you can't see is because you're looking too much. Your heart cannot see because your eyes has too many distractions. 
If you're going to write your vision, you got to first capture it. And you capture it by getting positioned in a certain way where you can hear what God has been saying all these years. Let me just stress here that your vision is not outside of you. God hid your future where you can't miss it. You've been told by religion, go and find God's will. And so for the past 30 years, you've been going from this prophet to that prophet, to this meeting, to that meeting, this conference, that conference, this crusader, this bishop, that bishop. You've been trying to find it. Some of you even went to, <laughs> I want to say it, astrology. Call me now. I mean, you went all kind of stuff to try and find why you was born and God is saying, this is stupid. There's a book out there, a whole, uh, three books out there. I want to recommend you buy them. Three books on potential. Please buy all three of them and read them in succession. The first one is understanding your potential. Read that one first, understanding your potential. Then read number two, releasing your potential. Then number three, maximizing your potential. Why? I, I spent 30 years studying this thing. And I discovered life is very simple. Simple. Life is simple. God hid everything that a thing supposed to become in itself. So your future is not ahead of you. It's trapped on the inside. A forest is not ahead of the seed. It's in the seed. Your future is in you, been there all along, but there's too much noise. So as you get home, clink, remote on. In the car, boom, 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 boom. So as you come out of the car, friends, yap, 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 yap. God is saying, man, this is a lot of noise for the last 50 years. I can't even get to this person. How did God get to talk to Abraham? God says, leave your home. Let's talk in the mountain. See, the reason why you can't discover you, even your, what you were born to do is because you don't even make time to discover it. Sometimes that's why God would allow you to get sick and drop you in the hospital for a couple of weeks on your bed. And then you finally hear God's voice for your life. Because you, you don't take no time. And by the way, uh, please get that book on prayer. It's very important. Because... Did I lose that? In the name of Jesus. Because it is important for you to understand that God doesn't play uh, cat and mouse games with us. He wants you to know what you were born to do. So you got to write it down. You have to write it down. It might be the plug. Now, this book on prayer. Oh, you got one here. Book on prayer. Write this down, please. Write this down. It's going to be very shocking for some of you, but please write it down. Meditation. Meditation. Write it down. Meditation is the most important aspect of prayer. What is it? What is it? What is it? What is it? Most of you never meditate. Never. You talk too much in prayer. <laughs> you never hear from God while you're talking. And 99% of your prayer is you talking. And when you finish talking, as far as you're concerned, the exercise is over. So you leave. Please buy this book. Let me tell you. Your dream is never revealed to you while you're talking. And we think prayer is talking. May God have mercy on us. I want you to go back home changed. Are you? I said, are you? When you go to prayer again, please pray 10 minutes and sit for 60. And just listen. You'll be amazed how loud he speaks. Finally he gets to talk.
Meditation. Prayer is you talking. Meditation is you listening. Suppose you and I have a conversation. You come to see me to ask for some things. You tell me everything and then don't wait for me to even tell you what I want to do. You just leave. That's stupid, isn't it? We do it to God all the time. And God goes and say, ah, ah, wait, don't go ahead. I didn't answer you yet. Where are you going? Wait. And you're gone. You think you already did your prayer time. See? And you keep asking God, how come I'm not hearing from you? How come I'm not getting any direction from you? God saying, because you don't, even, you, don't even, you don't wait for the directions. You give me instructions. Is this good? Yeah. Dangerous stuff, eh? You must know where you came from. Now, am I lost? God forgive you. Okay. Anyhow, everything I know is already downloaded in me because it came out of me. All right. Number two. Write all of your desires on paper. All of them. Now, this is important. You might end up with 10 pages. Don't be alarmed. We're not ready for simplification yet. Write all your desires down. Think about everything you would desire to do before you die and just put it on paper. It may end up being 10 pages. My own was about maybe 8 or 9 pages when I worked with this as a teenager. Don't panic. You're getting out your desires. The Bible says, I will give you the desires of your heart. But he says what? You got to trust me first. eh? Trust in him means what? You trust in what you're hearing. And then he will give you what? The desires of your, point at your heart. Gotcha. He's talking about the mind. (laughs) In other words, all these things you've been thinking about and and ignoring for the last 40, 50 years has been the voice of God. You know, let 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 me give you something very important. The voice of God is so simple, we ignore it because it's not sophisticated enough. You ever heard quote-unquote, men of God talk like this. Quote-unquote, men of God. The Lord spoke to me last week and said, and then it made you feel bad, right? I mean, you sit there going, how come he never speaks to me? Okay, and you begin to feel like these are very super spiritual people. So let me just destroy all the stuff you think about them. All they meant was, I had an idea. Whether it's Benny Hinn or Copeland, or Hagen, or Oral. What they're simply saying is, I had an idea that wouldn't go away. (laughs) Well, then if that's the case, then God's been speaking to you for a long time. Don't mystify this thing. Your vision is the thoughts that won't leave you. Your vision is the dream that keeps coming back for 30, 40 years. It started when you were 10. Your vision is the desire for you to do something that keeps coming back. It's your deepest desire. I'm not talking about desire for house and car. I'm talking about the desire to change a situation in your world. It's there. I know you've been feeling it. That's why I told you that your purpose in life is the thing that makes you angry. It's the thing that you keep seeing and you get mad. No one else gets mad at it, just you. Whatever makes you angry, you were born to solve. Start writing that down. 
write down what you feel is a solution to the thing that makes you angry. Because those thoughts, I remember reading this as a young teenager in the book of Psalm. It says, the thoughts of a righteous man are always right. I couldn't believe that when I read that. Because I was taught by the church to not trust your thoughts. The thoughts of a righteous man are right. Righteous means what? Properly aligned with God. That's why I say you trust in the Lord. Get yourself aligned properly and then he will give you whatever comes out of your heart when you're in that alignment. The desires that you have. That's why you came to this summit. There's some desires in your heart that you want to accomplish. And they're being refined here. You, you, you go back to your hotel room in the nights and you begin to think. Look at the window out of the ocean. You begin to think, my God, what am I doing in this place? I'm, I'm feeling some things that frighten me. That feeling is good. Feeling is good. Don't be afraid to dream while you're here. Most importantly, write it down. Now, when you write all of your desires down, like I say, you may end up with a lot of information on paper. It's important for you then to Simplify those nine pages of paper to concise one-sentence statements. In other words, you may have seven or eight different things that you really feel strongly about. Just write them down and simplify them in sentences, simple sentences. I remember mine, when I began to crystallize mine, I, I had a passion to see young people changed. As a teenager, I had this passion. So I wrote it down. And then I began to think, how can I do this? I began to think, I can do it through music because I had this natural gift of music. So I wrote down, I would, I would write music specifically to attract young people. I began to simplify it. Then I said, okay, so then I will write music and I will form a group that will sing music that will attract young people. And my vision began to get clearer and simplified. I ended up with this idea. I'm going to form a group that will produce contemporary Christian music to attract young people so I can tell them about God. I had it all on paper. And then the vision began to grow. We started having, we had, we, I formed a group, we started writing music. Music began to attract young people. We had four or five thousand teenagers in the same island coming together to hear our music. And we tell them about God, they got saved. I was 16, 17 years old when we started doing that. And then the problem started. What do you do with these young people? Because they weren't going to church. They came on the streets. So the vision grew. We had, to form, we, had, we had to form these relationships with these churches to send these kids to these churches. Now the churches didn't know what to do with the kids because the church you know, were, out, were not prepared. So we had to develop a whole new system of meeting on Saturday nights. So we formed this other little place called, you know, a crossroads lighthouse where we used to have all the kids meet because they had to find somewhere to go and we started these coffee houses. In other words, as, as the vision is simplified, it begins to grow. Because your vision creates more new opportunities for you to solve more problems that are, are, that are raised by those solutions that you already given. Your vision may start very simple and it ends up being a conglomerate. I mean, today, our organization is worth, you know, multi-millions of dollars. But it started with seven people in, in, in my apartment. Just to solve a problem. There's a passage of scripture that is very, very simple, but profound. Proverbs 19.21, my favorite verse. It says, Many are the plans in a man's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. Proverbs 19.21. Many are the plans in a man's heart. Vision must be captured. You ever heard these, these uh, scriptures? Paul says, Capture every thought. You ever read that? 
and bring them down to the obedience of Christ. In other words, don't just sit there thinking. Capture them. Bringing them to the obedience of Christ means that you compare them to the word. And if it's in line with the word, he say, hold on to that thought. No matter how big the dream is. Casting down imaginations and every high thought that what? Exalts itself against what you know about God. All the others, you capture. <laughs> Why? That's him talking to you. So you get an idea that you're going to build a boys school to help young boys in your city. Or you're going to build a girls school to help girls. You check the Bible, see if that, that, that God's against that. If God ain't against that, you better start writing down your dream fast. That's your assignment. So I got this idea of robbing banks. Got this big dream how to rob banks effectively. You can compare it with the Bible, thou shalt not steal. Okay, so then that can't be God. See, it's not difficult to figure out God's will for your life. Are you with me? Yeah. Have a desire to be a multi-millionaire so I can be rich and go play golf and go boating all my life. Go play with the word of God. And no one gets, just doesn't fulfill the great commission. So that's not a vision from God. No one gets saved with me having a billion dollars in the bank. <laughs> Casting down imaginations and every high thought that exalts the suffering and knowledge of God. Then it says what? Bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of who? Christ. All right? Capture it. Number two, simplify. Number three, document it. Document means you write it down, put it in a form that you know that you can understand. And what your goal is, is to try and get your entire life's purpose in one sentence. Now that may take a long time to do, but it is possible to do it. You want to reduce your life to one sentence. Write that down. If I can ever get you to get that point, I'll be successful in this last session. Reduce your life to one sentence. In other words, you have to somehow identify your gifts and your talents and summarize them in one sentence to the point where you know this is who and what I am. This is what I bring to the world. This is what I give the world. This is what I offer my generation. This is me and this is what they need from me. That's your vision in life. You got to capture that in one sentence. Next, you must communicate that simple sentence. Put it in a brochure. Make a plaque out of it. Put it everywhere you are. Talk about it. Talk about it to people. I told you earlier this week that people exist to help you, but they got to find you first. So you got to capture that. Then make a plan based on that sentence. A plan is your strategy to get to your vision. By the way, I learned something about planning. God doesn't plan for you. Next point, revise your vision. Notice the word re re revision has vision in it. Re means what? To go back. So a revision of your vision means you keep going back to check to see if you're on course. Because God may even adjust some things. He may even change. Don't be afraid to give God something to adjust. And finally, evaluate your vision. Evaluate your vision means that you keep judging yourself. Am I doing what I said I was born to do? Or am I getting off track? A few suggestions. Suggestion number one. Your greatest enemy 
is distraction. Suggestion number two, the greatest distraction is not bad things, but good things. The greatest distraction to your vision is not doing bad things, but what? Good things. Important lesson to learn. And finally, Vision comes in phases. It comes in phases. It's fulfilled in phases. It's a term I use in my book. It's called phasal. I created that word. Vision is phasal. Phasal. P-H-A-S-A-L. It's phasal. What I mean by that is vision, God gives it in phases and is fulfilled in phases. What you're doing right now, you might not be doing in 10 years. This may just be a phase of the vision, a part of it. God expands it. In my book on leadership, there's a chapter I did on the purpose for leadership. Make sure you read that chapter twice. In that chapter, I talk about the fact that, that the greatest enemy of right is good. Write that down. The greatest enemy of right is not wrong. It's good. Satan knows you are too smart to do something wrong. So he'll basically focus on getting you to do something good. <laughs> because when you do something good, you think you're doing something right. You were born to find out what is right for you. When you find out what is right for you, then that's... That's what's right for you. Everything else may be just good or wrong. So preoccupation with a good thing is no substitute for the right thing. Stay with what you're born to do. And that means you should not accept every opportunity that comes along, even if they are good. Are you listening? Don't let people come into your life and change your vision to do something good with them. It's a statement I make often. It's a simple statement, but I live by it. Learn from others, but never become them. Learn from others, but never become them. It's important to learn from people. We don't want you to be like us, any of us, any of our team. No. We want you to learn from us. We want you to be yourself. That's the ultimate joy of life, is to be yourself. I have so much more to say to you now, but you could not take it. Are you happy you came here today? Yes. Anybody feel pregnant? Yes. Come on, man, say yes. yes. Yeah, my brain is pregnant. And I will have delivering of babies. I believe that the greatest thing in the world for you to discover is yourself. What you're doing now is not all you were born to do. Your greatest enemy of your progress right now is your last success. I'm afraid of success. Successful events, I'm afraid of them. Because success can stop you from progressing. What you were born to do, ah, is so much bigger than what you're doing right now. I don't care how great you think you are right now. Don't get stuck in that stuff. You're awesome. I say you're awesome. Some of you took a, took a week off from work. I know that. Listen, you have a great day when you go back to work. Just remember that the job is not your permanent address. Yeah? Go back to the job with a good attitude now, okay? Tell them, enjoy me while you can. I know you can't pay me what I'm worth, but I'll be here for a little while. I'll exercise my gifts in your environment, and I'll use your materials to develop myself. <laughs> yeah. 
Any questions, please? Let me quit. Yes, sir. Important to get questions here, so please listen. Let me, we'll leave together in a minute. Yes? Yes. Uh, let, me, let me give you a, a little suggestion here. If you have a vision statement already written, and you would like for uh, myself and others in our team to take a look at it and critique it for you, then we'll be happy to do that. If you are a member of our association, that is one of the things you have access to immediately, our input. We can go beyond that if you join our association. We will even offer you monthly tips in our newsletters that we will be producing this next year, teaching letters, we call them, for leaders. And this will help you understand these things we're talking about in practical terms to check you on. You also have an opportunity for us to answer you personally. You send us your emails of your vision statements. We review them. And we can send you back our comments to help improve it, refine it. If you're not uh, uh, sure of how you want to do it, how it should be done, we'd be happy to help you. All right? I'm finished. That's fine. Okay. Oh, you want to put them there? You all can, can write that list down, too. That's the list of instructions. Uh, that list you want to teach, okay? So you better write that down. That's good stuff. Uh, so that, that question is important. Yes. Uh, do you have it with you? Do you have one with you? you? Okay. So when you do it, you send it to me. Make sure you, you pull an application to join the association, and we can have an ongoing dialogue. Myself and some of the others, we'll be able to help you through all of that. Okay? Because we want everyone to make it to the top. That's what we want. We want everyone to make it to the top. And you are one of those people who deserve to be at the top. Yeah, yeah. At what level do you have to join? Really, it doesn't matter. You know, at any level. The minute you join the association, you have access to uh, our resources. There are different benefits at different levels. We'll be talking about that tomorrow when we close out on our last graduation session. You'll have a lot of information about the association. So uh, we'll deal with that. But right now, we want to focus on vision. Yes? And mission. Very purpose. Very important. Okay. I didn't get to that because this computer went off. But let me give you the three things. Write this down. Purpose. His question was, what's the difference between purpose, mission, and vision? Very important difference. Very important difference.